just uh, help us to look at God's Word this morning? This message series is about journeying with Jesus. It's not just about having an experience with Him and when I die, I'm going to heaven. There's a, that's a great promise, but Jesus is far bigger than that. He wants us to follow and to journey with Him. He wants us to experience His grace in all the dimensions of life. And that's what we're looking at in this message series. And we've looked at how God seeks us, how God saves us, how God cleanses, sanctifies us. And today I want to take a look at God's sustaining grace in our life. And when you think about grace, when you think about that, what what comes to your mind? What do you say? Some of us would say, well, it's his unmerited favor. Aren't you thankful for unmerited favor that God gives to you? Amen to that one. But friend, that's not the end of God's grace. It is unmerited favor, but God's grace is much more than that. It's his active power, his action in our life. God's grace is not just unmerited, which it is. I'm thankful for that. But it is his action in my life, in your life, to accomplish that which you could not accomplish in your own power and strength. What God wants out of your life, friend, he provides. And God's grace is his action in you to help you to become and to experience all that he wants for your life. That's God's grace. Philippians chapter 2, Paul is in jail and he is talking to these people at Philippi and he is saying to them, now he has already said in verse 1 of Philippians, let me just give you time to turn there, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians, there's a bunch of Ian books. After that, there's First and Second Thessalonians. So what's that, about five or six or seven books that all end with the I-A-N ending to it. But we're in the book of Philippians. This is a region called Philippi. And in chapter 1, uh, we're not there yet. We're going to show a verse here in just a second in chapter 2. But it's always good to get a context. Paul has said in the first chapter that he is confident that uh, what God began, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion into the day of Christ Jesus. That's chapter 1, verse 3. He helps us in chapter 2 to understand that if we have any encouragement, if we have any fellowship with Jesus, he says in verse 5, your attitude should be the same as Jesus. It should be one that gives your life away. That's exactly what Jesus did. He was in the very nature of God, but he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself. He gave himself away. And then he turns to our passage this morning, and he says this in chapter 2, verse 12. He says, Continue to work out your salvation, with fear and trembling. That means respect and intention. When you fear God, you respect who he is, and you're serious about your life. I love to laugh. I love to have joy. I love to laugh and you know joke and carry on. But we have to be serious about life too. And Paul says, work out your salvation with respect and seriousness about your life. And this is the part that I want to get to this morning. This is verse 13. You with me? If you're online, I hope you have a Bible, whether it's in your hand as a smartphone or a hard copy, as I prefer. For it is God, says Paul in verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Say this with me, because this is the principle that I want to get to this morning. Out of this passage, for it's God who works in you. Let's say this principle together. Can we throw it up on the screen, y'all? We work out, say it with me. We work out what God is working within. Say it again. We work out what God is working within. Well, Sean, I didn't think we work for our salvation. Friend, we don't work for our salvation, but we definitely work out our salvation. 
We don't work. We, this is not something we're doing to earn anything in our life, but with fear and seriousness, with respect and intention in our life, as Paul has just told us, we are willing to work out that which God, through his Spirit, is working within us. And you and I will never experience life in Jesus as he promised or desires if we misunderstand God's grace. God doesn't want us to be passive in our journey with Jesus. And so oftentimes we've heard this, that God gives us his grace, his unmerited, we can't earn it, we can't earn it, and we don't try to earn it. Everything is just simply a response of his goodness and grace in our life, but we are surely not passive in our Christian life. If you want to accept passivity in your life, you will never become the person God wants you to be. Jesus wants all of you so that he can change and transform all of you. And the same with me. And in order to do that, we will cooperate with, we will say to the Lord, what you are doing within me, Lord, I will work with you in the process and I will work with you, and I want you to accomplish all that you want in my life. This is one of those great transformation scriptures. But this is what Jesus wants to do in your life and in my life. It comes from Galatians chapter 5, and it's called the fruit of the Spirit. In reality, it is all the different dimensions of what love is, because as God begins to sanctify and cleanse and fill our life with his spirit. It is all about saturating and infusing our life with his holy love. That's what God wants to do through his spirit in our life. And Paul uses what was a metaphor that was very common for the people of that age. And he says, he looks around, sees trees that are bearing fruit. And he says to us in Galatians, look at these verses. So I say, Live by the Spirit. We don't live. I've been talking to you for the last several weeks, and if you're online, feel free to scroll down on Facebook or if you need to go back. But we don't live by our own sinful nature. That nature was set on our own and relying upon our own talents and strengths and desires. And Paul says, kill that off. Die to that kind of a person. We no longer live according to our own ways of life. We live by the Spirit, the very Holy Spirit, the presence and power of the Spirit of Jesus. Paul uses those terms, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, synonymously through his works. So I say live by the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and pace, uh, patience. I'm sorry, it's peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control, nine of those dimensions of love, the fruit of the Spirit. And then he says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And this has everything to do with keeping in step with the Spirit. God's grace is free, unmerited. We don't earn it, but we keep in step with his grace and his Spirit working within us. And see, we have to have a sense in which we're willing to practice what Jesus Wants us. He says, our willingness to develop practical ways of following Jesus, that's how Paul says we'll follow Jesus. That's how we'll keep in step with Jesus in our life. And we have this mistaken idea that we needed a bunch of God's grace when he finds us and saves us. Whew! Aren't you thankful for that? And we just say, what? That, that's God's grace. I'm thankful for it. And then we kind of have this idea, well, since he's found me and I've accepted him and now I'm saved, I'm just kind of coasting in my life. Friend, nothing could be further from the truth. We aren't coasting. We're gobbling up God's grace as we become more like Jesus in his character. To use another metaphor, airlines, we're not coasting at 35,000 feet. To be the person Jesus wants us to be, we're like in takeoff, burning fuel as fast as it can go through the engine. Because that's how Jesus wants us to work with him and allowing him to transform our life so that our very nature and character resembles his. 
there's a meme and there's a little reel that's out now. It's like, you know, do you need Jesus to do the bit? Friend, you need Jesus to go to Walmart, don't you? I mean, you need Jesus to get in your car. You need Jesus to speak to your wife. You need Jesus to speak to your husband. You need Jesus to speak to your kids. You need Jesus to get up on Monday morning and go to work. Amen to that? We need, like, we, we, we need Jesus. We, we are taking off, and we're burning his grace all day long. We're not coasting. But aren't you thankful God's grace never ends? We need it, and we burn it, but God's grace is there to help us all the way through it. He is always there for us. And how do we work with God's grace in our life? And I want to talk about this sense today that we don't just try harder and harder. No, no. And this is the big difference in our life. And if you and I are going to learn about what it means to follow Jesus, this is an essential principle that you need to see in your life. There's a big difference between trying harder and training ourselves more. It is not simply trying more, trying harder, just grunt my way in. Okay, God, you're gonna, so I'm just going to try harder. No, 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 no. You are, and I am called to train. And before we realize God's fruit in our life, before we do that, we have to cultivate our spiritual life in such a way that enables the blooms of love and joy and peace and patience. You ever see it in the springtime? Trees have those blooms. But the health of that tree dictates if that bloom will become fruit. That's the same way in our lives. We have to cultivate a spiritual life of intention and utilizing God's grace so that our lives are the the beds, if you will, by which good, healthy fruit can live. We don't try harder. We train wiser. We don't just simply say, I'm just going to grunt my way. No, 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 no. We train ourselves so that Jesus can naturally be a part of our life. Simone Biles, are you, this is the Winter Olympics. What a wreck they've been. It's just a mess. Terrible ratings, all kind of political issues. It's just a mess. But in the Summer Olympics, you may know who this is. For probably the last 12, 15 years, uh, you'd probably have to go back to the 1970s. Who, who remembers the name Nadia Comaneci from Romania? She had like five perfect scores in the whatever Olympics it was. Simone Bales is right in that same breath. 2019, she goes to the World Championships in Stuttgart, Germany, and someone inter- uh, interviews her before the competition begins as to what she's looking forward to and what her mindset is. And look what she says. She says, I never go into a competition trying to win. Look at this. I go into a competition trying to compete like I train. See, when you're willing to train, then it becomes natural. Then you don't have to worry about what's going to happen. You do what you've been training in your life to do. Now, you can want to go out there and do somersaults and all these other things, and you may, I can do that. No, you can't do that. Well, I'll just try hard. Well, you're going to break your back trying to do those if you haven't trained. You ever seen those like uneven bars or those pommel horses? It's like you would have to pick me up off of the mat. Why? Because as much as I want to do that, by the way, six days a week, twice a day, for three to four hours at a time, she was in the gym. You see what I'm trying to get to here? It's not a matter of just trying harder. It's a matter of training yourself so that when life happens, you naturally have the abilities and God-given graces in your life to have love and joy and peace. Anybody want to be a patient person? You just can't say, I'm just going to be a better... No. You work to find peace and you work to find a way of life so that you're not just tied to the anxiety and stress that happens if you go into it unprepared. The only way that you'll be a patient person is if you begin to work on understanding. Patience comes when you say to yourself, I'm letting my hands off of trying to 
influence, control. Lord, I need you to help me to develop and train patience in my life. That's the only way it's going to happen. You want to have self-control? I mean, literally, on our roads, it is a picture, highways and roads, of uncontrolled people, including me. Some of the hardest tests of my spiritual life are in having some irate person talk to me in person or this person, you know, messes up in the church. No, that's, I can handle those things. Practically speaking, one of the hardest things we do is not to become road raged on the roads because there's a bunch of stupid people driving around the roads. Amen to that one? You might as well just whack off the directional sign. They don't even use those anymore. You know, it's just like, oh, my word. Let me get out and take care of this. I mean, I'm just going to be very frank with you. But the only way you're going to have self-control is, Lord, let me leave 10 minutes before that. And oftentimes, it comes down to discipline in our life. Because why? You and I are screaming like a banshee trying to get somewhere because we're what? We're late. And all I'm trying to say is not just not that. That's not only the thing. But I'm just trying to say self-control comes when you just don't try, I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get angry. Please, Lord, I'm going to hit this person in front of me. Lord, if, that's, if you're going to wait until the moment, you'll never have the ability to display the fruit of the Spirit. So you, you train yourself so that you understand, Lord, I put these things into place so that when I'm on the road, go around me, dude. Just go around me. You're, you're acting like a nut. Just go, and you're not a, who, who does this? You live with that offense for two hours once you get to work. I can't believe that. Let it go because there's bigger things in my life. You understand my point there? You don't try harder. You train yourself so that when in the moment you're able to understand and sense God's working in your life. So there are spiritual practices that are the way that we work out our salvation. Training ourselves with the aid of God's grace enables us to grow in ways that we cannot do for ourselves. Here are some of them. Here are means or practices of grace in our life. Silence and solitude. All the other things that we could do stem from silence and solitude. You can't pray if you can't be quiet. You can't have whatever else. You can't read scripture. You can't. Many of these things stem from just, Lord, I need to develop quietness in my life. And don't you know we're so busy and I don't have my phone on me, but those phones right there are the antithesis of silence and solitude. You're never going to have a good life if you can't put you, And I, 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 I'm not saying to you that I'm perfect in this, but I am putting my phone in another room. That's what I do. Because if you don't, what do you do? I should be praying. I should be praying. I should. And that's all happens. And all we have to say, Lord, help me to train myself so that your spirit within me can do what you naturally want to do. Can you, can you imagine Jesus sitting with us, if he could, and looking at us spending hours and hours and hours and hours on our phone and the sense of disappointment he must have if he's sitting right next to us and say, really, Sean? Really, Sean? I am here, I want to change you, I want to be with you, I want to help you, and you're just simply looking at all of these. I'm not getting down on that, they're very helpful, but they can become a great liability to growing and training ourselves the way that Jesus would want to do. Amen to that? Just take that as a basic principle and apply it to your life. Look at this from the writer of Hebrews. See, this is the path of fruit bearing in our life. If you want to take that bloom in spring, and allow it to become the fruit that it wants to become, we have to hear the truth of the writer of Hebrews who helps us with this. Look what he says. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. It's painful. Aren't you thankful that the Bible is real? Because I'm telling you, when you take one step forward with Jesus, there's some pain involved. Guess who is doing that in your life? The enemy doesn't want you to take one step forward in knowing Jesus. And there's pain sometimes and discipline involved with that. And he, the writer of Hebrews says, you know what? It is. Discipline is not, 
thank God. I'm gonna, it's painful. Simone Biles, when she got up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go work on her, whatever it is, do you think it was, I just love doing this. You know how many billions of times she probably thought, I'd be better off, can I just lay here on my pillow? Have you felt that way in your life before? Can I just stay in bed? See, nothing is without pain. But the writer of Hebrews says, no discipline is pleasant, but later on, however, it produces what? A harvest. The blooms become full fruit, a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained, right? He knows it's not trying, it's training. What you're willing to train for when then the spotlights of your life come on, like Simone says, you do then what you've been trained to do all of your life. So powerful to keep that in mind. So therefore, he says, strengthen, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Amen to that? Don't all of us need a little strengthening in our life? That's what discipline does for us. That's what the means of grace, training ourselves, helps us with in our life. And here's the truth. Becoming like Jesus is different and so much harder than being filled with Jesus. Friend, I'm going to tell you this. When you become a Christian, God's spirit comes into your life. The very presence and power of Jesus comes into your life. And there's a moment in your life after you followed him when you say, Lord Jesus, I want you to have all of my life. And last week I said this to you, what you give to Jesus, he fills. And he can fill your life with his power and presence. But even after that's done, there's a sense in which, Lord, I know you fill my life, but I want to become like you. And that takes training. He can fill our life, but with the willingness that we have to follow him through these spiritual practices, that becomes the gateway for Jesus to really change our life. And the Nazarene church, I'm going to be quite quite frank with you. The Nazarene church for so long, Jesus, just do it. Just infuse me with your spirit, and and it'll be okay. And we have a bunch of Christians who've gone around and say, I'm filled with his spirit, and their lives have no reflection or resemblance to Jesus in their life. Matter of fact, many people in the Nazarene church who claim to have a holy walk, walk so much in contrasting with Jesus. And you say, what is, here's the problem. Do they have God's spirit? They sure do. But they've never been willing to train themselves so that when life happens, they resemble the very nature of Jesus in their life. I mean, who's been the churches? Even this church. I love Jesus. Jesus loves me. I have Jesus in my life. I want to, and then they act in ways where they go, what in the world? And Christians can act such unchristian ways. Who here can say that? It's us, right? I mean, I'm not looking at you. I'm saying I've done that. And the proof of the pudding happens when you're willing to say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you fill my life. Your presence and your power are with me. But now I want to train myself so that your power and grace can work naturally in my life. And if we're not willing to do that, we will live just like the world, even though Jesus is deeply within us. Here's the principle. Let's say it again. You don't have to shout it out, but I want us to get here. Say it again. We work out what God is working within. Paul says, keep in step with the Spirit. Train yourselves in godliness. Don't be passive. You're not earning anything. If you're trying to earn anything with Jesus, that is a wrong motivation, you got pride in your heart, you're not earning anything. Aren't you so thankful, Lord, for all that you've done to me? I want to turn around and live my life. Amen to that one? I'm not trying to earn anything. I'm just simply saying, Lord, I want you to have all of my life, and I want you to be a person that changes and transforms me into your likeness. If you want that, God will do that through your life. Work to cooperate with his grace And the fruit of the Spirit will blossom in your life. 
Anybody here, you just don't want to look around? You be like, oh, pastor, I really need to love people in my life the way that Jesus wants me to. Love for me has always been self-centered, and I'm saying through Jesus, love is wanting and willing the best for the people in my life. I want to serve and love them. Pastor, I need help with that. Here, listen. Jesus can and he wants to, but you and I have to be willing to say to ourselves, I'm going to train myself to love the people of my life. Look, you're never going to have an emotion of serving your spouse sometime. You just have to train yourself to do it. Who knows this? You have doofuses in your life. If you're just going to go off of emotion and try to love them, you never will. But because Jesus is living in you, and he wants you to love other people, you train yourself to love them. Love is not an emotion. It is a commitment to one's, one's other people in your life. Who knows this? When I begin to commit myself to loving people, I find the emotion of love on the backside. We train ourselves to love. We train ourselves to find joy. If you're going to wait for the circumstances of your life to change to find joy, you'll never find joy. You say to yourself right now, Lord, for all that you've done for me, I choose joy. I'm going to live with you. I'm going to experience and say, Lord, I got joy, even though I can't experience it right now. And oftentimes on the backside, you experience joy. Amen to that one? That's what it means to train yourself so that the power and presence of Jesus can work in your life. Friend, Jesus can do it as long as you and I are willing to walk and to work with Jesus to make it possible. He's patient. He's kind. He's forgiving. We're never going to do this overnight. Aren't you so thankful he's so patient and tender with us? But friend, he wants you to work out what he's working within. And you'll wind up one day and you'll realize, Lord, never perfect, but I'm beginning to show Jesus in my life. I never thought I could love this person. That might even be your spouse. It might be your child. Lord, I never thought I could love this person like I do. But you've been with me. I have committed myself to loving them whether I felt it or not. And look now what you've done in my life. Amen. Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Jesus is with you. His grace will help you. Just give him your life and walk with him and work with him. And this gracious Savior will transform your life and will transform my life. Amen to that. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. We did nothing to earn you. We did nothing. We were lost. You found us. We had nothing to offer to you, and yet you saved us nonetheless. You gave us your spirit to live within us. We don't have the strength. We don't need to. You want to live and pulsate through us, and you want to bear fruit in our lives. So, Lord, help us to develop the practices that we need to help us, not anybody else, to help us. For some, it may be beginning to read Scripture. For others, it may be simply praying. It may be for others becoming more involved in the fellowship of this church. For others, it may be simply developing a way to be quiet for five minutes in a day. Whatever it may need, whatever we need, Lord, may we work out what you are working within. We love you today, Jesus. We give you thanks. And now, Lord, as you've said, you want to give us love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. Self we, we want that more and more in our life. We want to be those kind of a people. We're not going to be perfect, Jesus, but we want to resemble you. That's what we want, and that's what our world needs. So give us your grace, Jesus. We love you today. Change us, Jesus. We give you permission. It's in your name we pray.
Amen. Amen. 